So let me uh, let me just begin by saying that, uh, as Jeremy mentioned, I did start out as a political historian, and then I moved into race and uh, and punishment in the South, and then I got into um, medical history when I wrote polio. And one of the things that struck me immediately uh, about the history of medicine was how little of it is taught um, in the lower the junior high, uh, up in the high schools, college, even graduate school. Um, I went through the entire process without ever learning about the great influenza of 1918. Uh, I learned about <clears throat> World War I and the Treaty of Versailles and the Red Scare uh, and the League of Nations, but I never learned about that event in 1918, 1919, that killed more people in a shorter period of time than any event in human history. Between 50 to 80 million people died, probably close to 5% of the world's population in 1918. It was so incredible that the average age of an American went down about 11 to 12 years in that one year and then of course began to rise again. But it is just a monumental event and one of the most destructive events in human history. And we only really began to learn about it when COVID-19 came because we had to look back to try to find antecedents, threads, has this ever happened before? And then people obviously began to discover the great influenza of 1918, 1919. I wanna tell you a little bit about it. And then at the end of the lecture and hopefully in the Q and A session, we can also link it to what is going on today. In other words, what is its relationship to COVID-19? Um, it was called, the great influenza of 1918, 1919 was called the Spanish flu. Uh, and it's really unfair to Spain because it didn't really begin in Spain. Um, <clears throat> Spain, like many other countries, England, France, Germany, the United States, Spain was hit by the great influenza. But the difference was that Spain was a neutral nation in World War I, as it would remain in World War II. And because Spain was neutral, it had a relatively free press. In other words, there was no censorship going on. So it found no reason to hide the fact that many Spaniards were getting this awful influenza and were dying of it. England didn't want to mention it, France, the United States, Russia simply because they didn't want to alert the enemy that a certain percentage of their soldiers were basically on their backs and dying because of this influenza. So in the United States, you had the kind of censorship where if you would actually look through newspapers during World War I, you will see very little about the impact of the great influenza. And that is simply because the news was being censored. Um, and therefore, basically, the, uh, the Spaniards take the bulk of that. The great influenza comes in three waves. And this is important. The first wave comes in the spring of 1918. The war is going full blast. There are army camps that are training thousands and thousands of soldiers in the United States. There are soldiers at the front, obviously, who've been fighting for years um, uh, in France and in Germany and the like. The first wave is a relatively mild wave of influenza. A lot of people get it, but there are very few deaths and very few hospitalizations. It's more like the typical flu that we get every year. And then suddenly something happened that summer and we have not really been able to figure out exactly what it was, 
but that relatively mild flu went through what is called an antigenic shift. And basically there was sort of a reordering of the virus particles and the genetic makeup of that influenza. And a monster was created. Generally you have something called um, an antigenic drift. And that occurs every year. So that each year the flu is slightly different. And that's why you have to get a new flu shot every single year. When you have an antigenic shift, it means that this shift is so extreme that basically it will have an enormous impact upon those who have never come in contact with it before. And that is what happens in the summer and the early fall of 1918. One of the interesting points is that those who got the influenza, those who got the flu in the spring of 1918 were largely immune to the really harsh influenza that occurred in September, October and November of 1918. Now, what, why was it so different? And why did it spread so quickly? And, and who was most at risk for this? These are questions that, that medical experts are still debating um, about 1918. Why was it going everywhere in the United States so quickly. We had probably 700,000 people died of influenza in the United States in that one period. We have had 220,000 deaths from COVID. That is an awful lot. And we haven't had that number since 1918, but the number in 1918 was at least four times higher. Obviously it was soldiers who were coming home from the war they were coming home from the front. Many of them were run down. Their immune systems had been somewhat compromised. They were packed together into these troop ships that brought them home. And then they went back into their neighborhoods after no, basically around November of 1918. And that's when the flu is, is really on its, having its second leg, it's uh, coming down. So, that is one explanation, but what is really interesting about the influenza that hits hard in the fall of 1918 is that the young don't get it in large numbers, meaning children, older people, seniors, citizens don't get it in larger numbers. The people who are most susceptible and are dying in the largest numbers by far are people ages about 18 to 40. And everyone said, um, well, okay, it's because that was basically the age of our soldiers when they came back, except studies that have been done in that era show that women aged 18 to 40 also got the flu in equal numbers as, as veterans who came home and died in equal numbers. Male civilians who had not fought in the war also had hugely high death numbers. So we're looking at a kind of curve that is crazy. And hopefully we'll talk about it in terms of COVID-19 as well. Kids aren't getting in any great number. Older people aren't getting in any great number. Those really who are most susceptible are the healthiest people that we have in this country. Why would that happen? And what we really talk about is something called a cytokine storm, a cytokine storm. And what that means is that when an invader enters your body and your immune system has no immune memory, it has never seen this virus or this bacterium before, your immune system will kind of go into overdrive in trying to figure out some way to battle that invader. People 18 to 40 have the strongest immune systems. So what occurred was what is known as the cytokine storm, meaning that these people, their immune systems were battling at full speed against an invader it had, they had never seen before. And 
the battle takes place very deep in the lungs. The, the thing that, that was interesting about the 1918 influenza is that it's really not in the nose, it's not lining your throat, it goes deep down into the lungs. And what you have is this mess of dead cells and flotsam and all kinds of mucus and liquid. And you are having young people who are basically drowning in their own fluid. And what makes the cytokine storm so extraordinary is that the most of the people who get it, get the influenza and have this reaction, die not of the influenza, but of bacterial pneumonia. In other words, all of this buildup in their, in their lungs actually drowns them and they die of bacterium. The, the, the influenza is started by a virus, but what really kills you is bacterial pneumonia. Now, we have to understand at this time as well, when we look at what's going on today um, with influenza or COVID-19, um, we're gonna get a vaccine fairly soon. I think that's obvious. There was no vaccine at this time. Um, we have monoclonal antibodies, which are very, very effective. Um, we have antivirals, which will be used to kill influenza and are, are very effective against things like HIV AIDS. <clears throat> and we have steroids. And what steroids do, if you were to have a cytokine storm today, you would probably be given steroids which calms down the immune system. And the problem with steroids is that on the one hand, they'll stop, they'll stop a cytokine storm, but on the other hand, because your immune system has been suppressed, you are therefore more likely to get other kinds of diseases. So once you're on a heavy dose of steroids, you're pretty much put into isolation. So what you, you are having in 1918, 1919, is this monster deadly influenza killing almost you know, 5% of the population. Most of them tend to be strong young people. Now, there are no therapeutics. The only thing they're using at this time basically is aspirin and they are overusing aspirin and there are deaths from aspirin poisoning during 1918, 1919, and a lot of whiskey. Basically, those were the two things that were used. Um, and you either survived or you didn't survive, but you didn't have the therapeutics that we have today. What I'd like to do very, very briefly is to talk about what I think the big lesson of this 1918, 1919 influenza is. And that is what we'll also talk about when you see some of the reading and that is that in 1918, 1919, the only thing that public health officials could do would be to rely on non-therapeutics like social distancing, masks, keeping people out of crowds, um, staggering work hours so that not everyone was together on the subway at the same time. And what really is interesting is that about a decade ago, a series of researchers, medical researchers, published a piece in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which I, I will certainly send to anyone who wants it. And in that study, what they did was to look at 40 American cities, 40 American cities during the great influenza. And what they found out was that cities that basically started lockdowns early, kept them going throughout the epidemic and ended last with cities that had far lower death rates than cities that did not. And in your reading, you will see uh, there were two cities that I gave you that did not do very well in this respect. And I think what makes that study so interesting is that everyone is tired now of being indoors. People are losing their businesses. Um, students are taking their classes virtually. 
Um, and people inevitably tire of this. Uh, and what you've got to understand is that there are many ways to go ahead and to do this, but that social distancing does appear to work. It did flatten the curve. It flattened the curve in 1918. It flattened the curve early um, during the great COVID epidemic, certainly in New York City. And right now was we're kind of loosening restrictions and, and, and getting sort of not great guidance from the top um, what we're seeing is the possibility of a second spike arising. What I want to do, I know I'm, I'm, I'm sort of getting toward the end of my half hour. I want to talk to you just about a, a couple of other things. Um, the Southern Hemisphere just went through uh, its winter. And we have a lot of evidence about what went on down there. Um, and they are now, we are, as we head into our winter, you know, what lessons can we learn from them? And one of the things we found out, and this occurred in Chile, it occurred in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, everywhere across the Southern Hemisphere, is that lockdowns and high vaccination rates for influenza basically cut influenza to almost zero. For the first time in anyone's memory in the Southern Hemisphere, there was virtually no influenza. And the obvious reason for that is that the lockdown that went via COVID-19 also had a dramatic impact on other respiratory diseases. And you also had countries like New Zealand, which have a notoriously low influenza um, vaccine rate. And they, they were running out of vaccine. There were so many people who wanted to get protected because that what they are most afraid of is what we call the twindemic. In other words, what can really happen here very shortly now that influenza season has begun and the clock is ticking, what we really can have here is a twindemic where we are going to have a second spike of COVID-19. We're gonna have a normal flu season, just a normal flu season. And that is gonna wreak havoc on our hospitals, our doctors, our first responders, and also the amount of medical gear that will be available. So there really are lessons to be learned. And the lesson from COVID, from influenza is clearly the lesson that non-therapeutic measures work. The final point I want to bring out, and it's sort of a, a controversial point, is where, if it didn't begin in Spain, where exactly did it begin? There are some people who believe that it began in an army camp in Kansas. Why in an army camp in Kansas? <clears throat> because lots of soldiers were brought together from all over. Um, they brought their germs with them. They were in very close quarters. But also they were in the middle of kind of an agricultural area where pigs were kept, where poultry was kept. Um, and we know that if you do not separate these animals, um, unlike a disease like smallpox or polio, where there are no animal hosts, influenza always starts with an animal host. So it's very possible that being in that area, um, there were just, the pig may have been a mixing bowl for avian viruses, uh, uh, pig viruses, human viruses, and the like, and it just escaped, it's possible. There are many who believe it began in China and came over to the battlefields of Europe um, because Chinese labor was being brought in, particularly by the British, to help dig trenches um, and, uh, and, and, and take care of <clears throat> non-military functions. That is also possible. Um, we, the, the bottom line is we really do not know. But what we do know about influenza 
is that when you have a mixture of pigs, poultry, poor sanitation, a very large population brought together, um, very little government oversight, you are going to be a consistent breeding ground for all kinds of viruses and especially for influenza viruses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what I would like to do now is to, I think I've sort of given you a sense of what the great influenza was like, um, the enormous impact it had upon society in the number of deaths. Uh, what is really uh, the final point, what is really quite remarkable is that we actually did sequence the influenza virus, the DNA of the in influenza virus. We know it. We don't know it for the, uh, the, the spring influenza. We don't know it for the later influenza, but we do. We did sequence the virus. It's amazing. We know what that virus was. It was almost certainly an avian virus. How do we know this? It's really an amazing story. Um, when soldiers died during World War I, um, some of their lung tissue was cut out when the, those died of influenza, was cut out, put in paraffin, put into a military museum and kept. And, and those particles pretty much disintegrated. But in the 1990s, this kind of lone wolf epidemiologist from California heard that in Washington, they were trying to sequence the virus. His name was Holton. And what he did with his own money was to fly to Alaska to go to a town way in the north of Alaska that had a very thick permafrost. And he asked the elders of the town, Aleutians, whether he could dig down and see whether he could find the remains that would be basically had been protected by the thermofrost. The elders said yes, they did a, a kind of religious service. And he came across a young woman about 30 years old. She was obese. Um, her fat had protected the lung tissue. And he dug down literally with his own shovel, um, took out a uh, scalpel, cut out uh, a bit of her lung and sent that sample with the virus in it to Washington, D.C. And that amazingly is the sample that was used basically to determine the DNA and the makeup of the great influenza of 1918. There are so many fascinating stories attached to it. Um, and what I'd like to do now I know I've used up my half hour, um, is to go to questions. And thank you very much. So David, we started a, a, about 5.10. So if you have five more minutes, you don't have to, we can go right to questions, but we have a oh, few Oh, sure, more. sure. I can, <clears throat> one of the things I'd also like to say, Jeremy, is that over time, in other words, if you were at living in 1900, you probably, your, your chances of living past 50 were not that great. Um, and what we do see over the 20th century is the basically longevity gets greater and greater and greater. And the great influenza is obviously um, the worst epidemic we or the world has ever seen. But since that point in the 1940s, we got antibiotics. We got penicillin, we got streptomycin for all kinds of pneumonia, bacterial infections, tuberculosis. In the 1950s, we got the great polio vaccine, which was one of the high points of um, American science. And then we got the mumps vaccine, the measles vaccine, and they began rolling off one after one. So I think one of the interesting ways of ending, Jeremy, would be to say this. After the 1918 pandemic, <clears throat> basically, we did go on an upward curve where life expectancy in the United States kept increasing. By the 1960s, epidemiologists and infectious disease doctors 
were so certain of this trajectory that they actually began writing articles in medical journals encouraging medical students not to go into infectious disease. It was basically something that had been done. Move on to chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and the like. But infectious disease basically was now something in our rear view mirror, just like the great influenza of 1918. Think of the incredible arrogance of that moment. Think of Legionnaire's disease, Marburg disease, Ebola, HIV AIDS, Zika. Think of H5N1 and now COVID-19. Nature is always one step ahead of us. That is the lesson of the pandemic of 1918 and that is the lesson of COVID. We will find the technology to deal with COVID, but somewhere in a bat cave, somewhere in a wet market in the world, another virus is bubbling up and we are basically going to have to deal with that. And I think the lesson of COVID is that we have to understand both the importance of science, but also our limits in relation to nature and, and the fact that this is an unending battle.